the mark of the beast. My dear brothers and sisters, I have prayed all day about this subject. It is solemn. It is very moving because everybody who gets the mark of the beast is lost without exception. I want to read a little bit to you in the book of Revelation chapter 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horn ten horns, ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. If you listen carefully, you're hearing the very same descriptions that were read to you a few nights ago from Daniel 7 and verse 25. A beast with ten horns. And the Bible says another horn power rose up amongst them and began to speak great words against the Most High and would wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change God's times and laws. Daniel 7, 25. Now John is seeing in vision what Daniel saw. And he said upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Then he describes this beast. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. But the very next line says, His deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon. Who in the world is that? Revelation 12 and verse 9 tells us that's the devil. Now here are people worshipping the devil. Inadvertently. They worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast saying who is like unto the beast. And who is able to make war with him? And then the scope of his time is given in verse 5. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Daniel 7, 25 said he would blaspheme God. Power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. That's 1260 days. Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 34. These texts say in reckoning time prophecy a day for a year. And precisely 1260 years of supremacy for this religio-political power that would rule the world, that would blaspheme God, that would destroy saints through persecution and assume the prerogative of God and try to change God's law. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't have time to go into every little detail of this symbolism. I want to get to that which is most important. But what is the attitude of the enemy toward those who obey God? I see you're writing the texts. I love that. Revelation 12 and verse 17 says, And the dragon, verse 9 tells you that's the devil, And the dragon was wroth, angry, with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, there are connections to make. Let us pray that the Spirit will teach us tonight. This dragon, this devil, this adversary has focused his wrath especially upon a group of people who are God's remnant church. And they are specified in Scripture, keeping the commandments of God. Now that's very important. They keep the commandments of God. And they have the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus, Revelation 19.10, is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, the writings of God's prophets are adhered to strictly by the remnant church, which also keeps the commandments of God. Now that attitude of anger toward commandment keepers will characterize the beast and all who come under his influence in the last days. The target will be 
those who are obedient to God, already we're beginning to see something unfold. Those who get the mark of the beast will choose the commandments of men above the commandments of God. And a line will be drawn between those who say we will only obey God and those who say we will follow tradition. And I'll tell you right now, the majority will be the traditionalists. Let us go on. The attitude then is that we will war against those who keep the commandments of God. Now, Revelation 14, all of these chapters are right together. And verse 9, the Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man, if what? If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. I think by now... You probably feel we ought to avoid this mark of the beast. Am I right? Because they are headed to fire and brimstone. And the safe thing to do is get out of that crowd. I'm reading directly from the Word of God. Now I'm going to read verse 11 and slide into verse 12. I want you to hear it. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now these are they that are burning up. And John sees the conflagration as if everybody is burning up and he wonders where are God's people and verse 12 tells you. Read it with me. Here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of God. Would you say amen? amen? The line is drawn between those who obey God and those who obey man. And the Bible predicted that a power would arise and, and try to subvert God's law and think to change it. And history records that that power did, and we have shown you already in documents. We have others which we will show you tonight. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is obvious that the mark of the beast comes with the greatest condemnation in the Bible, and it comes with the severest sentence in the Bible and it is handed down by the eternal judge. I want you to witness, say amen if you understand what I'm saying. Those who receive the mark of the beast are those who will receive the greatest condemnation and the most severe sentence from the eternal judge. The most awesome threats in all the New Testament are against those who choose man's law ahead of God's law. The seven last plagues, Revelation 16, they fall upon those who receive the mark of the beast. And I read to you from Revelation 14 that God's wrath will be poured out without mixture. Every time God has sent judgments in the earth, it has been mixed with mercy. They have been mixed with mercy and grace. But when the final time comes, probation will have closed. It'll be too late to pray. The decree will have gone forth. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And when that happens, probation closes. No more sermons. You don't have to come to church anymore. You don't have to listen to a preacher anymore. It's too late now. The jig is up. Therefore, the wrath of God comes unmixed with mercy. 
serious? You better believe it. Ladies and gentlemen, the judgments of God against the image of the beast and those who get the mark are the most chilling in all of Scripture. And the sentence is the second death, which is the worst sentence that one can receive. Now, what is this beast? I told you the other night, and the Bible says it, that a beast represents a king and his kingdom, an earthly power and those over whom, over which he exercises power. Now let us go on. Verse 14 of Revelation 13 says, and this, no, let me catch verse 13. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Oh, please listen to me. There are people today who are so gullible that their whole idea of faith is attached to signs and wonders. Somebody asked about miracles earlier tonight. I believe in miracles. I have been healed. But if your faith depends on a miracle, you have a very flimsy faith. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, Now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Your faith must be anchored to the word of God and not to signs and wonders. For the Bible declares that when this power is going at full swing, he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Verse 14, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which, should, which had the wound by a sword and did live. I'm going to come into that in a moment. The wound that was healed and he did live. And they caused them through deception to form an image to the beast and worship the beast. Verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, look, look, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Verse 17, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And then the last verse says, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Of a what? And his number is six hundred, three score and six. That's six, six, six. God is being as explicit as he can to those who will hear his truth. He is enlightening us through these mighty prophecies that are yet to come. A nation shall form an image to the Roman power. It will not be Rome necessarily, but an image. When I look in the mirror, I see somebody, but that's not me. That's my image, and it's just like me. And the nation that will do that would be a new nation that emerges at about the same time the deadly wound was inflicted. Don't worry, we're going to explain it. And the nation that did that is none other, could be none other, than our own beloved United States of America. Oh, but you say, wait a minute. The First Amendment, the first uh, of the Bill of Rights guarantees religious freedom. Yes, sir. But right now it's under assault. Politicians want to have a constitutional convention. It's in the paper all the time. They want to force morality upon this nation. And whenever religion is forced by the state, 
you may know automatically it is a false religion. But when they start forcing it under penalty, then they are acting just like that first beast, Rome, which forced their system of morality and killed 50 millions of people during the Dark Ages. The image to the beast will seek to imitate everything that was done by the previous power. Now we ask, where does this second power get its power? Where on earth did the first beast get his? The Bible says in verse 2, And the beast that I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, who? And the dragon gave him. Who is the dragon? And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. This first persecuting power that sought to change God's law and that put to death 50 millions of Christians whom they called heretics, this great power got its power and its seat and authority from the dragon. Revelation 13 and verse 2. It's right there in your Bible. How did this happen? In 321, you can write down the notes and check it in your library. In 321, after the severest persecution under Diocletian, Constantine became Caesar in Rome. He was a pagan. Constantine began to see the balance of power shift from paganism to the church. In 321, Constantine passed the first law enforcing Sunday worship. Until then, there had never been a religious law requiring observance of Sunday. It was done first by Constantine, who was still a pagan. Two years later, in 323 AD, Constantine joined the church. And when the emperor came in, the gates were let open and pagans flooded into the church and brought their festivals and their holidays and their religious ideas and many of them have been baptized into Christianity. And today we look at them and don't even know that they have no basis at all in Scripture. They are pagan. I mentioned a few of them. I talked about Easter. Now we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and that's wonderful. But a chicken and an edge, egg and a rabbit have nothing to do with the resurrection of Christ. They have to do with paganism and the goddess of reproduction in the springtime. And the church brought them together and said, all right, you heathen, you can worship with us. We'll celebrate the resurrection. You celebrate Easter and we'll all join together. And they named it Easter. Christmas, it's all right to commemorate the birth of our Lord. I'm very happy at Christmas time. But what has Santa Claus and trees and Yule logs and poinsettias and red candles and balls on the Christmas tree to do with the birth of Christ? Nothing. They are pagan symbols brought in and joined together by the church a mingling of paganism and Christianity. Now, Constantine did something very soon after he became emperor and joined the church. Rome had been the capital of the Roman Empire for all of these hundreds of years. Constantine got another idea. In order to control both the eastern and western halves of his empire, he decided to move his capital city. He built the city, Byzantium. He named it Constantinople. Have you ever heard it? Constantinople after himself, Constantine. 
and he moved the government headquarters over to Constantinople and left Rome vacant. And the papacy moved in and sat on the throne of Caesar. That's why the Bible says the dragon out of paganism gave to this power his seat and great authority. The church took over Rome. And if you think I'm kidding, then you go to the Vatican right now. And you will see 116 embassies in the Vatican. The United States government doesn't send an embassy to a church. They send embassies to nations. And since Ronald Reagan, we have an ambassador in the Vatican. Along with 115 other nations. Are you listening? The dragon gave to the church his power, his seat, and great authority. I was in the Vatican one day looking at the marvels, the art. The, it's magnificent. And I came to a tapestry hanging on the wall. It was 75 feet long. And underneath it said, the donation of Constantine to the Pope. The donation of Constantine to the Pope. What did he donate? He donated the city of Rome. And the church became a kingdom. That is the first beast. Revelation 13, 6 said he would blaspheme God. What is blasphemy? In order to save a minute, let me give you the texts. Check them in your own Bible. Luke 5, 21, when Jesus said he could forgive sins, they accused him of blasphemy, saying, who can forgive sins except God? But today in the Roman church, they allege that every priest can forgive sin. That's why you go to confession, he sits in a little closet. Now, I'm not making fun. I'm simply telling you the truth. And I never belittle sincerity. And some of the finest Christians on earth are Catholics. So the priest sits behind a veil, and you sit there and you tell him about your sin. And he might tell you to say so many rosaries or whatever. And then he will utter the Latin words, A to absolvo, I the absolve. I the justify, I the clear. No man on earth can forgive sins. Now when Jesus said he could, they misunderstood him. They didn't know he was the son of God. I want to tell you tonight, he can. Would you say amen out there? The other text I want to give you is John 10 and verse 33. There Jesus called himself the Son of God, and they rose up to stone him. They said, you blaspheme calling yourself the Son of God. What they didn't know was he was. But from these texts, we get a definition of what blasphemy is. Now, the Bible says he would have power over nations. That's found also in this 13th chapter. Let me give you just an illustration or two. This Power chose emperors, chose fiefdoms, chose dukes, and gave these offices out as rewards for faithfulness to the church. There was a king of England named King John. He had to be humbled severely before the Pope would give him power to rule over England. Elizabeth I defied the Pope. And he sent word to all Catholics in England not to obey the queen. Then there was Henry of Germany. Henry of Germany. He offended the Pope. And he had to go to a place called Canossa. And in order to pay penance, he had to stand three days in snow barefooted before the Pope would forgive him. It's a matter of history. Read it in the library. There are books in there that will tell you this. Ladies and gentlemen, every specification was met by this first beastly power. Now the Bible says he would receive a deadly wound. A deadly wound. When did that happen? The Pope rose to power and took over Rome as a kingdom in 538 A.D. When did I say? 
The Bible says he would exercise power for 1260 years. That brings you to 1798 AD. And here is the thing I want you to carry home with you. Precisely on time, precisely when the Bible said, precisely in 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte, you ever hear of him? He had a general whose name was Berthier. He sent him down to Rome and took the Pope prisoner in 1798 and put him into exile in France. And in 1799, the Pope died of sickness. The deadly wound was inflicted. For a brief time, there was no head of the Roman church. It's history. General Berthier, the very year the Bible said, took him a prisoner, put him in Valence, France, as an exile, and he died the next year. But immediately, the Bible says, the deadly wound would be healed. The very next year, 1798, 1799, 1800, the very next year, they elected another pope, and the healing got started. But he had no real power until 1929. When did I say? At that time, a man in Italy by the name of Benito Mussolini. You ever hear of him? He signed a concordant at Rome, giving the Pope back not a whole city, but a hundred acres called the Vatican. And the deadly wound was healed. And the Bible says after that, the whole world wandered after the beast. The whole world! I have seen the President of the United States bow before the head of the church. He never bowed before the head of the Baptist church, nor the head of the Methodist church, nor the head of any other church. But I have seen presidents of this country bow. The Bible says all the world wondered. And if he did it here, which is a rather new thing, then think of all those nations that have been under the influence of the church for so long, they had their ambassadors in place long before we did. When Roosevelt tried to do it, they talked about impeaching him. When Ronald Reagan tried to do it, there was not a word of remonstrance from anybody. I wrote 10 letters to congressmen and senators. All of them answered me, and the only one that understood what I was talking about was Jesse Helms of North Carolina. And I hate to agree with him on anything. The deadly wound was inflicted in 1798. The Protestant Reformation had been moving with power since the middle of the 16th century. And now in 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte, himself a Catholic, sent his general down, took the Pope prisoner. The deadly wound was inflicted. He died the next year. And the following year, a new Pope was elected, and the world began to wonder after the beast. Now, Martin Luther enunciated the principles of Protestantism perhaps more boldly than anybody else. And he said, Protestantism is founded on the Bible and the Bible only. Now I want you to say that with me. The Bible and the Bible only. Martin Luther said, Protestantism is founded on the Bible and the Bible only. When Luther debated John Eck, John Eck was the most learned mind in Rome. He was sent up to put Luther in his place. But if you've read Luther as I have, he's a favorite of mine. I've read several biographies. You discover that God had so sharpened his mind. He was a monk, you know, an Augustinian monk. He really didn't want to leave the church. He just wanted the church to stop teaching man-made laws and selling forgiveness. And when Luther was brought to debate John Eck, John Eck could not stand before Luther. One writer said if Luther faltered, Philip Melanchthon and Karlstadt were sitting there in their slipping notes and point his mind to the Word of God. And he would look at it and answer John Eck. John Eck returned to Rome defeated in a debate. And he said to the Pope, we, and I'm quoting, we cannot match wits with these Protestant innovators. We've got to do something in order to answer them. And Ignatius Loyola, who established the Jesuits, came up with a plan. 
We've got to exalt tradition to an equal plane with Scripture. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are into some serious history now. We cannot answer these Protestants with Bible. We got to have a tool, and the tool has got to be tradition. I'm going to put it on the screen for you in just a minute. Right now, I want to tell you, in 1562, the Archbishop of Reggio, the Archbishop of Reggio openly declared that tradition now stood above Scripture. Did you hear what I said? The church is on record saying tradition stands above Scripture. And don't exclaim it is still that way. You read the Bible to people and they make excuses so that they can cling to tradition. This message that I bring to you is not easy to bring, but it's the truth. And the time has come for people to hear it. And I hope you can believe that I preach it with a great deal of sympathy and love toward those who never knew it before. We're going to the screen now and see some things. Ladies and gentlemen, the Word of God, Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth, angry with the woman, the church, and went to make war. Why war on these? Because they won't go along with tradition. They won't go along with man-made commandments. They are sticking to the commandments of God. And the dragon is angry and declares war against those who believe in God's law. Revelation 20 and verse 12 says, Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a what? A what? A sign. In the Old Testament, sign and seal mean the same thing. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify them or make them holy. God says the Sabbath has meaning. To most people in Phoenix, it has no meanings. The sons play basketball. The Cardinals play football. Folk go to the games. They mow their lawns. They go boating. They do anything they want to do. But God says, for me and my people, it's a sign that I'm their God. And Satan despises God's sign. There it is in verse 20. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Would you say amen? Don't you ever, I don't care if you never decide to obey God, don't you ever let anybody fool you again by telling you it doesn't matter. The whole thing hinges right here, whether we will obey God or obey man. The mark of the beast will come on those who obey man. Revelation 13 speaks of the time coming when religion will be forced and a country will force it just like the first beast forced it. And even though God will not permit mass carnage as he did during the dark ages when 50 millions died, even though he won't allow that, the, 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 the motive will be to kill. And I read it to you from Scripture. You either obey or you die. And with us getting accustomed to violence the way we are, it won't be any big thing for courts to decide that you die. One of the great Protestant preachers of our day on television said, desecration of Sunday is the cause of the moral downfall of America. They believe that. And he calls for law and order, a constitutional convention, going to make you keep Sunday. When force is applied, that's when you make a decision. If you believe it, you get it in your forehead. If you do it for any other reason, like keeping your job, you get the mark in your hand. Is that clear? If it is, say amen. amen. Forced righteousness. God has never accepted forced righteousness. You get the seal only in your forehead, but you get the mark in your forehead or in your hand. I've gone over that now three or four times since we began. Let no man deceive you by any means. I'm quoting the Bible here, and I'll give you the reference in a moment. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, 
except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God so that or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God there's only one man today that fulfills that awesome prophecy he sits in a temple he is called God and he says he is God for the mystery of iniquity doth already work Paul said only who he who now letteth will that until he be taken out of the way this thing is already forming in Paul's day power and influence wanting to force people he said it's already beginning and ladies and gentlemen just as prophecy had pointed out it came to pass the church has lost sight of the gospel and the gospel is free choice the gospel is whosoever believeth in him the gospel is not I'll make you righteous they've lost sight of the gospel and they have lost sight of the Sabbath sign in its place comes a mark just stick with it here I'm reading from Catholic journals and I say this with tenderness toward Catholics they need to hear this and some of them are hearing it and know it a young man came to my meetings in Chicago and when he heard that the church changed the Sabbath he ran to his priest he said father that man down there said we changed the Sabbath the priest said we did he said wait a minute I don't think you understood me that man said we changed the Sabbath the priest said we did he said, now don't you go back down there. <laughs> the young man not only came but was baptized and went then to one of our colleges to study the ministry. Plenty of good ones out there. The Catholic Church of its own infallible authority. Infallible? A human being is infallible. And yet this is what they teach. Now because they believe this, at least they have an excuse. What excuse do Protestants have? There is a bloodline between Protestants and Catholics today, and the church says they are simply separated brethren. They'll come back, and they are falling over themselves to get back. The church doesn't have to force anything. Protestants will force it. Newt Gingrich said he wants a constitutional convention to force prayer in school. He's not a Catholic. He's a Protestant. Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and poor Let's go on. Question. Now this is from the catechism. You look at it. You don't think Pastor Brooks is being hard. You look at it. And if you know how to pray, ask the Holy Spirit to give you light now. This is from the catechism. Which day is the Sabbath day? Answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. This is from Catholic catechism. Question. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Reverend Peter Gilman in the Converts Catechism I've got a copy of that catechism in my library. Now there it is. Now if that ain't plain, I don't know how to make it plain. And this was done in 366. Now, not necessarily that year. You see, those councils would last for 17, 18 years. But during the Council of Laodicea, in the 4th century, this is the 400 years after Christ, Peter, James, and John never heard of it. Catholics say, we changed it. Protestants say, well, we do it in honor of the resurrection. Who said so? Show it in the Bible. I'm not stuck on the Sabbath. I'll keep Tuesday if you find it in the Bible. If you don't believe it, find it. Or find Sunday, and I'll join your church next Sunday here in Phoenix before I go home. If you don't believe it, find the text. I'm not trying to be facetious or cute. I'm trying to make you think. Would you say amen out there? Amen. If anybody talked to me like I'm talking to you, I'd get stirred up. I'd go find it. 
And I wouldn't listen to excuses. And I certainly wouldn't listen to anybody who said, don't go back. That's not the answer. The answer is scripture. Let us go on. Truth was weighed against tradition. And men by the millions voted tradition. There's a picture of the great piazza in front of St. Peter's. I've been there many times. Look at this statement. The authority of the church is illustrated most clearly by the scriptures. For on one hand, she recommends them, declares them to be divine, and offers them to us to be read. On the other hand, the legal precepts of the scriptures taught by the Lord have ceased by virtue of the same authority. The Sabbath, the most glorious day in the law, has been changed into the Lord's day. These and other similar matters have not ceased by virtue of Christ's teaching, for he says that he has come to fulfill the law, not to destroy it. But they have been changed by the authority of the church. And you wonder what the apostle meant when he said blasphemy? Christ taught one thing, but that doesn't matter anymore. The church's authority supersedes. The word of God. Blasphemy. Oh, beloved, please understand me. I have more pity in my heart for people who go along blindly with tradition than you can possibly imagine. You don't know how I pray for you. And so, the Sabbath day is a memorial of creation. It is a sign that God made heaven and earth. Not some man calling himself God. He hadn't made anything. But the God of heaven made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. And the Bible says in the commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Why? For, for, here's why, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. That's the command. And he tells you why you ought to keep it. Why? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Now if, if that doesn't earn him respect over a man, then go on and worship the man. The Keys of This Blood is a bestseller. It's written by Dr. Malachi Martin. It is not an easy book to read. He was a former Jesuit priest. He's now on a staff to study and come up with answers. And he is not bashful. Very interesting book. The Keys of This Blood. Holy Father John Paul was asked toward the end of a private audience for visiting dignitaries in 1983. Can we expect your holiness to undertake many more of these papal visits to different parts of the world? That was the question. Here is the answer. John Paul replied with candor, until as many men and women and children as I can reach have seen the face and heard the voice of Christ's vicar. Of Christ what? Why am I pausing with this? I'm pausing with this because today scholars are coming up saying, well, we don't know about calling him vicar. He's always claimed to be vicar. What is vicar? Vicar means substitute. Christ left, he's the vicar. He's the substitute. I don't believe that. Catholics do. I don't. Jesus has the vicar. He said to his disciples, it's expedient that I go away, for if I go not away, the Spirit will not come. But if I go away, I'm going to send him. The Holy Ghost is here. That is Christ's substitute. Why was it necessary to send him? Because Christ was incarnate. He was in the body of a man, and he took on the limitations of a man. Christ couldn't be in Phoenix and Tucson at the same time. He is now housed in the tenement of the flesh, bound by the flesh, and he will wear the flesh throughout eternity. The nail prints will be in his hands forever. So he said, it's necessary for me to go away. Why, Lord? 
because I'm sending you into all the world to preach the gospel. And lo, I am with you always. Well, how can you be with me as a man? It's necessary for me to go away, and I'm going to send my other self, my vicar, the Holy Ghost. He is omnipresent. He can be with you in Rome. He can be with you in Ephesus. He can be with you in Israel. He can be with you in Antioch. He can be with you in England. He can be everywhere necessary for me to go and let him come. But no man is God's vicar. And these are the words of the present Pope. Until men and women and children, as many as I can reach, have seen the face and heard the voice of Christ's vicar. For I am their Pope. And this is what the blessed mother wishes her son's vicar to do. This is on page 122 of Malachi Martin's book. And so, the Pope, on special occasions, wears a triple-tiered crown, meaning he's king of heaven and earth and purgatory. Now, I don't believe that. I believe there is a king of kings. His name is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he is king of heaven and of earth. And since there's no such thing as purgatory, I'll give that one to the Bishop of Rome. And on that crown, on the original crown, are inscribed these words in Latin, vicarious filii dei. What does it mean? Vicar of the Son of God. He wears it on his crown. Vicarious Vili, Filia Dea. I have photographed the crown in the Vatican treasury. What do these words mean? What is the key to this mystic number? They are the words, Vicarious Filia Dea. In Roman numerals, V equals 5, I equals 1, C equals 100, A equals nothing, R equals nothing, I equals 1. U and V are the same in Roman numerals. That's another 5. And an S equals nothing. And the total of that is 112. Are you with me? The second word is filii. F equals nothing, I equals 1, L equals what? 50. And I equals 1, I equals 1. The total of that is... 53, and then Dei, the name of God. D equals 500. Are you with me? E equals nothing. I equals 1. The total of that is 501. Now we put them together. 112, 53, and 501. Let's get ourselves a total. And the Bible tells us it is the number of a man. 603 score and 6. Somebody said, but wait a minute, Pastor. Didn't Adolf Hitler's name equal that? Well, maybe it did. But Adolf Hitler didn't think to change God's law. And Adolf Hitler didn't persecute millions of God's saints. And Adolf Hitler didn't try to call himself God. The specifications fit the beast power. And there it is for you to see and to copy. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and that act as a... Oh, no, 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 no. I want everybody to say it. And that act is what? It is what? The title of my message is The Mark of the Beast, and this comes from their own writings. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act as a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. Here are the Protestants who said, Bible and the Bible only. And the church looks at them and makes fun. If the Bible then is your only rule, where do you get Sunday? It's our authority over you. You belong to us. Sunday is our mark of ecclesiastical authority. Choose you this day then whom you will serve. Jesus said in Matthew 59, read it with me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of, of what? Amen. Oh, my Father, how much clearer can I make it? Upset, choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
That's the way I feel, folks. And I wasn't born in this thing. I don't even mention my church. You notice that. I don't preach denominationalism. I preach the truth. And not only that, what I preach is not a, a competition between denominations. Did you understand what I just said? We're not competing with anybody. We just want everybody who wills to do God's will to know what his will is. Then choose. As for me and my house, I choose to obey God and not man. Do you feel that way? If you do stand on your feet right now, if you are willing to stand with Jesus rather than with man, stand up and be counted. Now, I know this might be new to some, but it's the truth. It's the truth. And much of this you can read in your library. You don't have to ask me. Find an intelligent priest and ask him who changed the Sabbath. He'll tell you. Ask him if he can forgive sin. He'll tell you. They believe this. Protestants, what do you believe? That is the question. Jesus said, read it. Oh, beloved, choose Christ. He chose us. And he didn't allow anything to stand in his way. And with all we had to do tonight, we are concluding on time. My beloved, I know this has been solemn. I know that many have never heard it before. But study the Bible. Study the text I've given you. Read them for yourself. And I can assure you that you'll find God's word there. You're standing now, and God expects you to mean it. On this coming Sabbath, we're going to have a baptism for those who choose to serve God rather than man. A baptism, the entry into the remnant church, which keeps the commandments of God. Not of a man or a committee or a council, but of God. Yes, thank you, Jesus. And may I just end by telling you, it's not a problem. It's a privilege. <laughs> Is there anybody here who can agree with me? It's a privilege. Great blessing. A blessing you will never feel running to church and then running to a ball game. That's not Sabbath keeping. Oh, Lord, I've said enough. Please now, through the Holy Spirit, speak to the hearts of men and women and children right now and speak truth. There is someone who cares when truth is trodden down. There is someone who cares when tradition is renowned. There is someone who cares and he's calling out his own for that someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares. The mark of the beast is real. There is someone who cares. Choose for woe or for weal. There is someone who cares. In faith receive his seal. For that someone who cares is Jesus. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May the blessings of God come home to your mind and settle you in the truth. For the seal of God is a settling into the truth.